Our architects, of which I'm one, but not one of these, are creating fanciful ideas about the future of cities in which four things seem to be common. The buildings are shiny and beautiful. The pipes seem to be rusty. There's lots of things floating through the air. And we all, it seems, will drink Coke. If you look at the future of smart cities by architects, this is the kind of nonsense that we get. Now, against all of this, there's a new wave of technology coming that's using the computer to try to understand the historic city to plan the future city. My own company's technology examines the flows of people in cities through streets, how they come together, and how we can efficiently design the layout of cities. Now, in particular, that means the flow of people on foot, because it's when you're a pedestrian that you can transact. It's very hard to do a deal from one car to another car. You have to be on foot. And the best, most sustainable, most financially significant cities are the ones, like the city of London, that have invested in their pedestrian infrastructure. I helped to redesign Trafalgar Square, the most important square in London, arguably Great Britain, using technology to study how people were flowing around the square, getting confused, using a computer model to analyze the way in which the square was disconnected by traffic and by its design. We then redesigned the square so that today people flow through the middle of Trafalgar Square and it's a place for people and a place for life. With technology, it's possible to measure connectivity, the connections between people, and run financial analysis to demonstrate that number at the bottom on the right is the difference between a disconnected design on the left with cold colors of disconnected flow and a connected street network on the right, where the streets are there, the connections are there, the flow is there. And that is 100 million pounds worth of, of value difference between one architect's disconnected design and another architect's connected design. We're using technology to value the impact so that we can then persuade investors to build the pedestrian infrastructure as we did with the Millennium Footbridge in London or the Olympic Park, connecting the Olympic Stadium to the residential areas around it, inside buildings, in shopping centers, to make sure they flow and they create wealth for their investors. And so to finish, this is my vision of the future of London, one of them, for new infrastructure for cycling above the railway tracks. It's called Sky Cycle. It's a concept to create 500 million cycle journeys into and out of London every year, creating, I believe, a smart city using old technology of the bicycle, old technology of the street network, but we've been running analytics with the computer modeling I showed you to demonstrate its impact, building that scheme into a model of the city that can help decision takers move from a position of uncertainty to a position of action at the bottom of the slide. And that, as a creative designer, helps me bring technology to resolve those problems I started with, to help create better, more sustainable visions of the future. It allows us to take a city like Istanbul and think of it not only as a traffic network with the major streets in red and the minor streets in blue, but as a pedestrian network, and to understand how the flow of people on foot can be enhanced into the future, so that our smart cities of the future are more likely to work for that social, economic, and environmental transaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now there is something about the financial side. <laughs> so now I'd like to have Mr. Pelawan make his speech. Um, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, I would like to thank the organizers for such an important event, sharing experiences. 
uh, but also I would like to uh, thank all the participants for their insightful view and also they allocated a lot of time for me so I can speak it until the end of the time or <laughs> shall I stick to the six minutes? Uh, First of all, uh, I'm uh, coming from an organization called Investment uh, Support and uh, Promotion Agency of Turkey. A uh, couple of words about it. We are attached to the Prime Minister's office. It is a very rare organization so that we can help all the investors, local and international. But as locals are very familiar with the investment environment in Turkey, our 90% of the support goes through the international investments. And uh, our agency is, does not only have a, a local uh, role. In January 2014, two months ago, we also take the presidency of the World Association of the Investment Promotion Agency. So we have now role of sharing experiences within the worldwide uh, 189 countries who are the members of this organization as well. So. I would like to announce maybe in May uh, 14, we will have the World Investment Conference in Istanbul for this purpose. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I mean, this is a very technical concept, but I would like to give you the first challenges and the opportunities in Turkey and uh, what the central government is doing uh, because uh, central government has the uh, obligation uh, to lay the foundations of uh, how to form a smart city and the local governments has to take these platforms, adapt, so that they can be used locally to make the cities more livable. The challenges uh, in Turkey comes with the opportunities. I mean, we, I, I like to mention the growth of economy, the success of Turkish economy is being discussed everywhere. We have tripled the size of the, our GDP since 2002. And uh, what is very good news is that we have a now a rising middle income people which their GDP per capita has increased from $3,500 to $10,500, even more. So the rising middle class is demanding. Uh, in fact, when we look at their expenditures, uh, they, most, they spend on education and healthcare services. Uh, they want better health, they want better education. And uh, if you look at also the activity of the private equity investors in the last uh, five years, you will see that they are investing in education and healthcare services as well because there is a very profitable business over there. But uh, not limited to this, uh, of course, uh, the rising middle class is demanding more livable cities. So they want uh, more luxury uh, items which they are not able to afford and luxury living style. And of course, without paying additional costs for these. And additional uh, information about Turkey is our population. We have a large population. Uh, in Europe, when we look at we are one of the largest population. And uh, if we compare the numbers between 2008 to 2012, our population has increased 6 million in numbers, reaching to almost 75.6 million. And uh, the, when we compare with the developing economies, Usually they are rising annually 1.1% and Turkey is growing by 1.3%. So our population is increasing slightly above the uh, average developing economies. And the uh, other uh, challenge we are facing is the migration from rural areas to urban areas. And uh, this is also uh, reflected we have in 2008 roughly 50 million living in the urban areas and when we look at in 2012 it is 57 million and 1 million out of this increase has uh, occurred in Istanbul so what is happening in the framework is you have a growing economy demanding rising middle class and population increase so which is making the resource in the city is very scarce so you need to use these sources effectively so that is why uh, maybe smart city, the smart and the city concepts were uh, a, a, you know, just a logo for many people, but now it has become in Turkey a necessity. And that is why uh, I would like to highlight everyone to read uh, the document, the strategy document, uh, currently underway, but it is also declared uh, on the website of the Minister of Development. They are uh, discussing in detail uh, in which directions they are looking at, but mainly transportation, energy, water, health, citizen services, 
services, environment and security are the dimensions that the Turkey has to improve and face with. Uh, going into the smart city concept, there is uh, the definition of a professor from Edinburgh University, which I just found out yesterday. Uh, I like the concept uh, because he splits the smart city into two disciplines, which is smart, the ICT, high technology, and the city part, which is the infrastructure for energy consumption and reducing the carbon emissions and the critical capitals such as water, air quality, even food. So. The, when the, uh, we need to look at Turkey in the similar uh, manner. So when I take the ICT sector alone, which is the smart part of it, we have a growing ICT sector. I mean, we have only 1 million internet users. Now we have grown up to close to 40 million internet users. GSM subscribers has come from in 2000 to if, uh, 20 million GSM subscribers, now we are exceeding 70 million subscribers. Broadband has increased in the last five years exponentially. We have more than 20 million broadband subscribers. And e-payment systems, uh, which is also a critical part of the smart systems. Uh, I think after the UK, Turkey has the second most comprehensive and the enhanced e-payment systems. And expenditure on ICT by the telecoms and the handheld devices, etc. All these uh, smart gadgets will be roughly 25 billion dollars in 2006. We are talking about two years ahead. And projections by the GDP in 10 years from now, from our 2023 goals, the uh, out of the 160 billion US dollars of GDP will be formed in ICT sector. So we have a growing uh, ICT sector to support the small city concept. Uh, we have discussed about the e-government. The government has started the e-government initiative for a long time ago, but I think we are getting the, uh, in 2008, they started the citizen-centric approach. What they mean is they have a couple of ingredients which I would like to share. One thing they uh, decided is keeping the queues cut. You know, long queues has been, uh, if you go 10, 20 years ago, everybody remembers long queues. You know, long queues, we have to cut the queues, cut the bureaucracy, cut the time. So to give some examples, like uh, e-health uh, appointments, you can call by phone or web services, you can get your appointment with a doctor. So this is important. Or you can pay tax uh, in your municipalities from online, so you don't need to go, such as I'm uh, from the southwest of Turkey, every year when I go for my holidays, I have to go to the municipalities and pay my taxes and come back. It is inconvenient, so this has been uh, removed, and the uh, online judiciary system, etc. There are 41 items which has been action. Is it sufficient? No. More to come. And of course, education is the key. We need to raise digital literate uh, people. I mean, we have a youngest population, average age of 29. It is one of the highest uh, in Europe. Uh, I think the second one was Moldova, ahead of us. We are number two. And we have this FATIF project uh, where we bring smart content, smart boards, and smart handheld devices so that the young generation takes the education on the online world and they go with the online world. So uh, let's look at the uh, infrastructure part, which I mentioned. There are good developments over there as well. In Turkey, uh, as a developing nations, we have challenges, uh, but also we have opportunities uh, because uh, to meet this developing uh, urbanization, uh, we have to build at least another eight, um, eight million more housing. And also we started urban regeneration program uh, because Turkey is an earthquake zone and uh, we have identified roughly six to seven million of housing which is prone to earthquakes. So these, uh, with the urban regeneration program, they will be knocked down or relocated and redesigned. So while we are building new homes and following the urban regeneration program, we can build green cities. So this is giving us the framework to build green cities. And uh, when we look at the energy ef uh, efficiency, we have uh, passed down 2008 uh, new legislation, if I recall the energy uh, performance of buildings, so that heat preservation and the electric usage in the buildings has been put into the standards. But more important, in 2012, we have laid down the ground for energy efficiency strategy. In 2023, 
where we want to take the energy efficiency and some action items has been defined. So it all sounds nice. Is there any result for it? Uh, I just find out one number. In February 2014, there are 81 buildings uh, certified green building in Turkey. So 81 buildings, we are talking about millions of housing. It sounds bad. But when I look at the Turkey's uh, ranking worldwide, uh, based on the certified and registered LEED projects, you know, LEED certification, one of these uh, certifying green building, by the US Green Building Council ranking, Turkey is in the ninth place worldwide. So it is not only the Turkey's problem. We see that, if, and out of those nine, I look at the eight countries ahead of Turkey, only Germany was on the eighth or seventh place. The rest was not from Europe. So the green buildings concepts are also new, not only in Turkey, but it's the world's issue that we have to take seriously as a globally. And uh, Turkey has foundations to move forward. As a ninth place, I think we have started a very good start, and we need to keep this action. And uh, not the least, there are a lot of other initiatives in the government, if I, uh, we can list a few other ones, but uh, one important one is information society uh, renewal, which I mentioned. Please check out this Ministry of Development website. It's a very good document to give you a benchmark of where we are, and uh, where we will be will be declared within this year. Minister of Transport, Maritime Affairs and Communication has declared a strategy on the national transportation systems. Uh, this is not city transportation, but the national scheme how efficient transportation should be made and some standards like uh, standard, uh, using from different uh, integration of different modes, payment, etc. And uh, of course, when you talk about city planning, so you need to have a geographical information system. It has been discussed many times in Turkey, but I think we will be going on pilot uh, this year. This is uh, recently we got the news. Uh, but this pilot, we don't know how long it will take, but at least uh, we are crawling at this stage, but uh, here and there, a central uh, government is putting the ground so that uh, the local governments can take and leverage on their smart city concepts. So uh, I would like to uh, leave the word to the chairman. If there are any questions, <laughs> I will be happy to take. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, actually, it's good to hear that Turkey is going through such a big change. And at this point, I'd like to ask Mr. Ganan about how their projects are changing over the years as Turkey is going through this change. OK, I, thank you. The automation of the local governments started in early 80s when late Minister Turgut Özal uh, was in charge. He was, he was uh, first of all, um, pushing the local governments to use the automation. And in order to... Uh, provide them with the financial strength, he transferred the emlak vergisi, the debt tax, to local gov governments from the, mm -hmm. from the uh, main finance of the government. That was, that was the first point. And at that time, of course, the applications were about the income management, about some taxes, like the home tax, or the tax, tax for the... Uh, advertisements and water subscription, that sort of applications. Mm -hmm. That was around 1985. Since then, this is now 30 years. And today, we are, of course, at a different point. First of all, MIS systems plus the GIS systems are all combined. Mm -hmm. And as I said in my presentation, the citizen is now involved in the applications and the state is now integrated. Let me give you a very, very simple example just to understand how things changed. Years ago, when there was a garbage pile somewhere that was not collected, what we were doing, we were calling the municipality, okay, over a wired line, doesn't matter, and then the guys were coming and collecting the garbage. Today, what we are doing, if we take the photograph of the garbage and send it to the municipality, and then the, they come and collect, it is more or less the same thing. There is not an improvement in it. The improvement is this. Now, 
you take the photo, you send it to the municipality, and then a work order is being initiate, initiated by the citizen, not by the municipality officials. The work order is initiated, and it is put in progress, and the garbage is collected, and then you receive an SMS to your telephone, and they says the, the work order is closed. This is, this is how we make the interaction increased. How, that is about the democracy, maybe. Uh, I have to say that as the participation of the people uh, increased towards the application, towards the municipality facilities and the services, that made us, that made us to bring here. Technology, faster computers, better applications, good terminals, better pixels and resolutions is not the, is not the uh, improvement itself. Mm -hmm. The improvement is the welfare of the people, increasing with the usage of it, but by the participation of the people as well. Mm -hmm. That is basically I'm going to say. Okay, right at this moment, I'd like to turn to Tim about the interaction site. On, on your slide, uh, there was the bicycle, and uh, uh, just before the meeting, we talked about the smartphone and the bicycle people and the new city. Can, can you elaborate a little on that? Because we have that problem very harshly in Istanbul as we cannot keep the old city as we are building the new one. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's always a tension in cities between the future and the past. Some cities want to forget their past mm -hmm. and focus on the future and demolish the old buildings. And um, some cities don't know which version of the past they want to demolish. And you end up in politics. And, and this is the reality. It's not to say it's right or wrong. This is just the reality. So what's happening in Turkey is what's happening in every city in the world. And of course, once you demolish, you can never get back. So de demolition is a big decision. My experience of the places that people love most in cities are the historic places. And so as soon as you demolish history, you remove a major financial asset. And so that's the kind of advice that we've been bringing to clients around the world. There's also a question of how you create history into the future, because an act of architecture or urban planning is the creation of the history of the future in 100 years or 200 years. And the question is, it, when we see new buildings being built, and I look out of the hotel room at the skyline of Istanbul, how many of those buildings in 200 years' time will still be there? Hardly any, I would, I would venture. Only the really, really good ones. It's very expensive to keep demolishing and building. And so to get it right is also an investment decision. Now, to get it right, in my experience, that means designing the bottom of the building as well as the top. If I can put it as simply as that, every building has a top and a bottom. My experience is we spend too much time talking about the top, how high it can be, is it, how is it going to look on the skyline of the city, and too little time designing the bottom where people are mostly going to be. The best buildings are the ones that design the bottom to be as beautiful as the top. And by that, I mean to have life, to have shops, restaurants, to have places that interact with the street and don't turn their back on the street. And I look at many modern buildings in Istanbul and other cities, and I see badly designed bottoms of buildings, which are negative places, blank walls. Look at the Ritz-Carlton across the road. When we go out to lunch, there's a building where they've really just thought about the top. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Is that all? <laughs> I just yeah. make a comment on the Ritz building. Uh, I think the Ritz building is the most hated uh, building by our prime minister. Uh, in his term, in the, when he was the mayor of the uh, city, he yeah. wanted to stop that construction, but he couldn't manage anyway. But uh, I concur with the idea that some of those tall buildings uh, is, a, is an issue. 
Uh, but uh, I just want to clarify on the demolition part, the urban regeneration program. Uh, I go through it very quickly. The urban regeneration program is designed uh, to demolish the buildings which are prone to earthquake. So if you don't demolish them today, they are safety hazard and in the next 10 years. And anything culturally and historically, they are preserved. They are out of the scope of this context. So if you go to the in old Istanbul site or if you see an old historical building, they will be preserved. So uh, there is a preservation on that respect. But uh, Istanbul is a, a city which takes uh, a lot of immigration and so we we had bidon wheels and bidon wheels turned into the uh, interesting construction which is not prone uh, to the resistant prone to the earthquake. So mm -hmm. what we are doing is uh, that is the heart of the soul of the project. In fact, once uh, it is not done on a building basis, uh, basically these projects are realized, you get together in a sub-regional text, so it should be uh, a part of a district, and when the project is redrawn, it has to be approved by the Minister of uh, Urbanization and the Environment, and one concern is the street size and the green area. So mm -hmm. in return, they provide these people, you know, if they have four floors, most probably they give a little bit smaller, but better housing. Maybe sometimes it could go a li little bit higher, but not higher than what it is currently today. So this is the concept, and it is started only uh, a year ago. Only uh, we have, I think, 300 to 400,000 housing done. Uh, so it's a 20-year long project. So that is why uh, I think the city planners, when they need to take place in this urban regeneration project, in fact, the new uh, minister of the uh, urban planning uh, has also uh, changed the way the implementation. Initially, this was done centrally at the ministry level. Mm. So he is trying to push it down onto city, municipality level, such planning to be done within the city. So I think uh, what central government is trying to do is push it, these things to the city so they can do this bottom planning. And I think it is really important we have to do this in Istanbul as well. Okay. to have a walkable uh, cities. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion, but uh, so I'll give you the word, but before that uh, I should comment actually that uh, international uh, design software producers are uh, providing a special software when you're trying to build a building, they also calculate how the wind will be changing and the other things, how the traffic congestion uh, will be affected and all this and this part of the IT side now I, I hope to see uh, such solutions also implemented in Turkey I, I know that there are some problems because I live in the historical part of the city and we have uh, different uh, wind policies let me say than uh, the past and this provides air pollution and it's not uh, like the good old days but I'd like to have Tim uh, have something to say on this? Yeah, I, I guess you want to say, say something? Just, just briefly, thank <laughs> you. I think this is such an interesting discussion and it's very relevant to the future of both the city of Istanbul and cities worldwide. Um, when I look at old parts of cities, yes, of course, you find buildings which are technically unsound and it is best to either strengthen them or to remove them and replace them. That's a sound argument. When you move to the urban planning scale, what I've also noticed is that those old buildings sit on old streets and have a connection into the community, which is very beautiful. The street pattern of the city is very beautiful. In the UK, we demolished many parts of our cities after the Second World War, and we removed the street network and we replaced them with high-rise buildings and lots of landscape, and we destroyed the community. We, we built strong buildings. We built landscape, which was then a problem because it wasn't looked after properly, and we destroyed the community. I think you have the opportunity to learn from that history, and, and it sounds very much at, at that local level that this is what's happening. It's very encouraging to hear. Mm -hmm. So now uh, I'd like to turn uh, to you about uh, 
consumerization of the cities. Mm -hmm. Actually, while I was coming here, I, I was at a, a, in a bus and I had such an experience. There was a tourist bus waiting uh, just at the bus stop. An old lady couldn't get into the bus because she had to go around that bus and at that moment the bus moved and there was a bad interaction between uh, the lady and the driver saying you didn't wait for me and, and nobody had uh, any guilt about it but <laughs> there was a problem and it affected the interaction maybe the lady or the driver will go home and shout at his wife or husband and t it will be a big problem so how can you use the data about uh, the city to make a more comfortable life within the city for the citizens? It's, it's interesting because there's, there's a lot of value that can be generated from uh, exa exactly this, is making the city uh, pr provide better services to, uh, to citizens. And it doesn't necessarily need to be the city, it can actually, can actually be from citizen to citizen. So for example, uh, there were many times I was on the highway driving along and looking at people coming in the opposite direction to me, thinking, no, 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 don't go that way. There's three, uh, three, three miles of traffic. Now we have a system called Waze. You can put, you can put in, uh, information on where traffic is and you can crowdsource so we can communicate together as a society to actually warn other people of where and where not to go. And that little application, which solves a very small problem, has created, uh, I think Google bought it for $900, $900 million. Huge amounts of value has been created. In, in London, uh, we have a, a little app, a homemade app, uh, to solve another very small problem, which is if I want to get a taxi, if I want to get a taxi in London, I now have an application on my phone, which I can book a taxi, and I can see where that taxi is in relation to me and when he will arrive. Fantastic application. Mm. They've just secured 30 million pounds worth of funding and are taking this application internationally. And I think that's one of the interesting things about, about um, you know, smart cities and smarter cities, is that if you can solve you know, little problems in one city and then you can scale that a around the world, we all, we all benefit. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, if there's any question from the audience, we can take one quick question and I see one at the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Youssef. I run a smart cities consultancy based out of the UK also. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Pahlevi at the end. Uh, we do some work in the Middle East and North Africa as well on smart cities. I'd like to understand uh, what programs are there in place to involve the youngsters in the decision making of the services for smart cities, particularly in rural areas where there's such a high migration from rural to urban areas. In the Middle East and North Africa, as well as in Turkey, the population, 30%, uh, sorry, 70% of the population is under the age of 30, and most of the decision makers are actually the, over the age of 70. So I'd just like to get some uh, comments from Mr. Pahalevi on this, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, young population are the key uh, in Turkey. I mean, they are driving the growth. They are the, you know, uh, of the our economy, and they are forming the fundamentals of our future. Uh, in the general sense, uh, I mean, I can talk more about the central government uh, usually what they are doing. But on the locally, uh, also what I have seen is. Uh, the local municipalities, you know, they need to, they are doing some surveys, uh, you know, it is not, they are doing general surveys, but also they are listening to young uh, groups as well. These are being carried out. Uh, but also one thing, it came to, uh, I always talk about the government, state, citizens, but there is very interesting from youngsters uh, I would like to talk about. Uh, in our organization, I also uh, traveled through to find the innovations uh, around Turkey. There was an event uh, last month, and uh, again, this young population, they take their own initiative and they establish a uh, business uh, startup community, in fact, using of uh, waste sources. Uh, so they establish this community and uh, they turn, they, what they are doing is they are creating business ideas from this forum. Uh, one of the business ideas was very interesting. 
It is addressing the city transportation project. It is, I think, if I'm not wrong, one of the application was the vault, the other one was share my right. Uh, the idea is if you are traveling from A to B, ah, the vault guy is here. Yes, you see, I know you from Startup Turkey. So, uh, so from you go from A to B and you just say, I'm going there, you want to hop and then they go. Or there are taxis sitting around, they are doing nothing. Or rent a car companies, they have a bunch of cars sitting down idle, they are doing nothing. And you are able to mobilize those resources which is not used so that they are efficiently shared and uh, also uh, the cost per head is decreased and less cars we see in the street. So I think young people's not only uh, through the surveys, etc., to be listened, I'm trying to conclude, uh, but also they are creating solutions, such innovative solutions. So their solutions has to be uh, encouraged to be deployed. Uh, so I think there are two axes of that. Okay. So. Uh I'd like to thank all of you for your participation and valuable comments. And I'd like to thank the audience for joining us. So uh, I'm just five, five more. <laughs> well, we're closing down. Maybe you can have one-on-ones uh, with the audience. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>